The objective today is to examine several environmental variables and relate them to processes running on a computer. So I think the best way to learn about this particular topic is to study several variables. And then the conclusion can be made that these are just things that are changeable, like all variables are, and they will affect the way programs or processes are running on your computer. The first thing you should know, these are not like the variables we've discussed in programming or we've even used in shell code while doing some CTFs. So if you have that background with me, um, we need to just make that distinction right away. So here's what we'll do. I'll first start with an analogy. Then I'm going to try to hammer down the differences between this programming concept of variables and s system variables. And then we're going to talk about how like processes, that is like a program running processes, can query these values so that that program can do the thing that you're trying to get it to do. And to finish, we'll just go over several examples and we'll do so on both Windows and Linux. Okay, so my go-to example when I'm teaching programming is always this score, the score that Super Mario has. And we can call this variable score, and this is what's displayed, and it changes throughout the game. And it changes in a variety of ways, whether he gets a coin, or he jumps and hits one of these mushroom guys, or he finishes a level in a specific time. So then this variable is put through some sort of calculation to output a particular score for him. Now for environmental variables, we're talking about an operating system, not a game. And they're called variables because they can change, but they are not changed very often. So one such variable is temporary, and I'm not talking about like the temperature of your computer, but the variable called temp is usually for temporary files. So for example, if you're running a process, that process can query the value of temp so it knows where it'll store or save the files that are just going to be temporary for that program. Another variable is like the home or user profile variable. Whoever's running the process, that is like whoever's logged in, that is going to be their home variable. And you could look at the directory structure of that user. The directory structure is the organization of files into a hierarchy of folders and it should be stable and scalable. It should not fundamentally change or be added to. So I'm gonna show you something kind of cool here from where I'm at, me, the user, I'm going to go ahead and type in the command tree and we'll be able to see that directory. And if you want to make your eyes cross on Linux, you could install this tree command, then navigate all the way to the very top of your directory and type it in. When I did that, I imagined I was Johnny Five from Short Circuit reading a book. If you don't know what I'm talking about, this classic movie about a robot. I just love that scene. I he says input, more input. This right here kind of summarizes my life. So let's jump over to PowerShell here. As you can see in the user folder, I am R. Houghton. So if I type in tree, that is the directory inside of that entire users folder named R. Houghton. Now if I wanted to go a little smaller, I could go over to my Z drive. And so if I want to take this one chunk at a time, I could scroll up and we can look at something like my PyCharm projects. I have a folder in there called First Big Project, and in that folder I have a file called Idea, and Python has these virtual environments, so that's an interesting thing. And if we just kept going down, you would see, you know, there's a scripts, I mean, let's go up to something a little simpler. I have a folder called Downloads, and in Downloads I have a Documents thing. And this is just, you know, your typical tree. We're just looking at it in the command line instead of over here with, like, the graphical user interface. Okay, so the concept of having environmental variables go back to 1979 with version 7 of Unix. And that's pretty interesting because I've just recently done some videos on, like, early CPUs. So the x86 architecture also starts in 1979, the Intel's chip, the 8086. But anyways, these environmental variables were included in all the Unix operating system flavors and variants from that point forward. Same with Apple's DOS, 
And of course, Linux was based on Unix, so environmental variables are on all the operating systems. They just have different syntax, usage, and standard variable names. Sometimes it's frustrating, sometimes it doesn't matter. Like at least path is the same on all of them. So in Unix, the environmental variables are normally initialized during the system startup. This is being done by the init scripts. And so all the processes on the system inherits these variables. Now in Microsoft Windows, each environment variable's default values is stored in the registry, which is an aha moment for me that the registry is the environmental variables. Now let's talk a little bit more about path. That's one of the trickiest ones, which the good news is it's not tricky at all once you get it. It says here that the path is a variable specifying a set of directories. So we just looked at all those directory trees, right? This path specifies where executable programs are located. And in general, each executing process or user session has its own path setting. So if I want some action, I need to know what path to take so the computer can execute that action. Well, not necessarily I, the user, but I, the computer that is executing the program. So what does the path variable do? It allows execution to happen. So for your typical user, inside the binary folder or the user binary or the user local binary directories, these are included in the path settings. Now the super user, that is the root user, administrator, whatever you want to call them, they typically have an extra folder called sbin or user sbin, and these are specific system administrator commands that can be executed, of course, by the system administrator. So if you're on Linux and you want to check out what this looks like, you could just type in echo path, and each separate location is divided by this little colon you'll see here. Now here's the explanation of what the path is doing, and I do have a little confusion here. It, it said that the path is used when the shell searches for commands that do not contain a slash in their name. So I have a program called ape.py. It's a Python program. And if I just type this without a slash, the shell would be searching for this ape command even though it doesn't exist. But Python does exist, and I wrote this file. So I need to type in dot forward slash ape dot pi for this program to run using the Python commands that the computer knows about because I downloaded Python. So I think I could delete the part about me having a confusion. At first, this was a bit of a confusing thing for me. So I'm telling it to you now so you can learn from my mistakes. Over here, this wasn't a screenshot. I just lazily Google imaged it. But like this one is a screenshot from my own computer. And you'll notice that ape.py has a little star because I had a chmod plus x at first so that it could execute. And as you can see, my program was a very simple one that is like spitting out some hexadecimal numbers. Why? Because it was a part of a CTF I was playing. And if you want to play these, I suggest you start with John Hammond. He does a terrific job of explaining things, and that's why I adopted his use of an ape name, as in this ape Python file is just like an ape throwing his feces on the wall and hoping and seeing what sticks. My programming is definitely comparable to feces. Some people's path is insane, as you can see here. There's too many folders with too many executables. You can see, like, Perl is in here. He has something about NASA, like Ruby is over here. I mean, this is just crazy. Now, something to be aware of, if you do like CTFs or you are interested in being on my Cyber Patriot team, it says here that the current directory, that is the dot, this is sometimes included by users as well. What it does is it allows programs residing in the current working directory to be executed directly. A lot of system administrators do not include this in the path in order to prevent the accidental execution of scripts. And these scripts can be uh, maliciously placed by somebody and you don't want to find yourself with a tar bomb on your computer. There's a great XKCD comic about a tar bomb. But seeing how this is a vulnerability, if you play games like Cyber Patriot, that might be a red flag if you see the uh, current directory inside the path. Okay, so when a command name is specified by the user or an execution call is made from a program, the system searches through path and it examines each directory. You saw all those directories I spit out. Well, they're usually not that complicated. They're usually smaller like this. I'll show you mine on my virtual machine here in just a second. 
So the system searches through the path, examining each directory, interestingly, from left to right. It's looking for a file name that matches the command name. When I learned about this, it was mind-blowing. And so let's go ahead and see this in use. I'm going to go over. Here's my PowerShell window, so I can CLS all of that. There you go. So I just typed in this simple command. You can do so too on your own machine. And as you can see here, that when I downloaded VS Code, I didn't, you know, put this in myself. And by the way, in PowerShell or Windows Command Prompt, um, this semicolon is separating the folders. But anyways, I didn't put this Microsoft VS Code folder in my path. It automatically happened when I downloaded this program. And it's a great program, but I guess I could see how a guy like this could find himself with so many different paths if he's downloading programs that automatically add to the path variable themselves. So in that sense, sure, you can manually change system variables, but so can programs. Now another way to look at this on Windows is you can open up these environmental variables. So go ahead and spend some time looking at that GUI. Sometimes I think people have a tendency to look at this stuff and just like really not pay attention or read anything. So here's your think right share on this screen. What is the user's name? Oh, and then there's some more semicolons uh, separating things. So not a big deal. One more variable I should tell you about is this home one. This is so easy. This is where your folders and files are stored. That is that you, the user, created. In this one, I'll show you myself here. You just type in print env on Linux, and it's the same thing in Windows, just different. So it just looks different. Uh, your think right here, what's the username here? Which variable is called user, and then what's the value? And here's another list of just other variables and what they are, what they do. Again, in Linux, term was a confusing one to me. Apparently, different hardware terminals can be emulated for different operating requirements. And I can either click on terminal or click on X term to get the same command line. So when we go over to this virtual machine, I want you to particularly pay attention to the value of my ls colors variable. You see, I inherited my first Linux machine, and I did not understand why when I listed out folders, folders and files, they were all the same color, while other people on YouTube, like that John Hammond guy I was just talking about, when he used a list, they were color-coded, and I really wanted that feature. So then I found out that you just change the value of that variable, and so when you do that command to list stuff, it'll color code things for you. All right, so here we are on the virtual machine. I'll go ahead and click the terminal. Type in print env. I'll enlarge the screen for you. So here's all the system variables I have and their values. And here's that ls color one. So what does all of this do? I know it looks pretty crazy. If I clear this, when I ls, now these folders are blue. And this thing, examples.desktop, is white because it's not a folder. I change directory to one of these. Let's go to Documents. Oh yeah, on Linux, uh, capitalization matters. So now I'm in Documents. When I ls this, I got a white, a purple, and a green. So thank you, ls color variable. So that's the end of the lesson here. Your DOL is simply to go to the Wikipedia page about environmental variables and just find one that you like to tell me more about.